Um, tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome the wonderful uh, Win Jin Ho, uh, an artist whose work spans drawing, print, filmmaking, artist books. I, I could probably continue to go on, but I should probably stop there. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to hear more about Draw Brighton and also to see all the things that you're doing with um, students at home. It's just really impressive. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, we're the lucky ones here. And um, I know you've kind of prepared uh, a lot for us tonight. So just, I guess, to give some context to that, um, I've asked Winjin to um, put together a little bit of background to how she ended up um, working as a professional artist and sort of how she moved through some of her professional practice. Um, and I know because you are so well set up with all of this, um, I guess I could just open the floor to you and ask, um, how did you get into it all? And where Shall I you... go ahead with my, um, with my PowerPoint? <laughs> That'd be lovely. Okay. How I got into it is a very good question, actually. So I will start sharing and I'll go through uh, my backstory. So um, here you go. This is my, um, yeah, this is my backstory. So I thought I'd start at the very beginning, which is um, in the 90s. Um, and I thought I'd tell you about how I moved to more of an art career from a veterinary um, background. So I started out, um, Sorry, I'm a bit nervous actually. Um, I thought um, I would show you the book that I made when I was at college. So don't become a vet unless you're completely crazy. But I did study this course. So the reason why was because I grew up in a veterinary practice. This is my dad's veterinary surgery. And I admired him very much and his zest for life and also have a Chinese background. So, you know, there wasn't much choice. And um, I was doing this absurd course because actually before I joined, I knew I wanted to be an artist. So what I thought I would do was draw all the things that really annoyed me about the course. For example, tall cows, their poo goes in your ears, the smell and noise of pigs. And that's me in the top corner looking really grumpy. The fact that you had to wear really practical outfits and that they were always really drab and in brown colorways. Um, the hazards of walking a dog at nighttime when you couldn't see whether there was something in the grass. And you know, the kind of live sex shows that we were forced to endure. Um, this bull wasn't really doing his job. So um, we spent a long time trying to coax him and um, it turned out that he was actually gay. But I realized that this training was actually quite um, good for my natural interest in using my hands. And I turned out to be quite good at expressing bladders and pretty quick at castrations as well. An important skill. I know. <laughs> 12 minutes. Um, so, and if you think about it, like I wanted to go to art school and here I was looking at cell slides like this, which actually comes from a talk that I attended yesterday. And it's really abstract. And this kind of imagery kind of forces you to think in a creative way when you're trying to record it and trying to remember it. So it wasn't all bad training. And so I graduated and I got to hang out with chameleons and this little chameleon had a problem giving birth to her eggs, which we figured out for her. And, you know, it's an absurd profession, um, complete with um, comical slides. So here's a nice picture of a dog. Um, but I still had a dream to study uh, and make more work as an artist. And I didn't really know how I could do that. But I applied to the Japanese embassy for a Monbu Kagakusho scholarship, which is um, a government exchange program. And it allows anyone to um, study at research level in, um, in Kyoto, well, in Japan, but I, I went to Kyoto. And so I went straight from my vet degree to this magical town on the other side of the world to study with Kurosaki Sensei, the teacher on the far right. 
who was a woodblock artist. What's going on here with the eggs? Well, they're made of paper. So um, the paper teacher is this one here. And then there's the etching guy and the lithography guy in Kurosaki. And there was a really amazing, strong department. It was like a liberal arts department um, that also had a manga course. So kind of really unusual in Japan. And he's, he, you know, he passed away last year, but he is just an amazing um, practitioner. Here's his work. It's on handmade paper, sometimes from Korea. He used really dynamic abstract imagery and um, he printed on both sides of the paper and had this really subtle sense. Like you might be able to see there's this very subtle shading of um, darkness around these shapes. So it kind of pushes and pulls you in and out of the canvas. And I absolutely adored his work, but he wouldn't tell us how he did anything. We just had to watch him. So I found myself with all these new tools, like what do I do? And um, practicing on my own in my um, apartment and trying to figure out the, the tricks of the trade. Was that mostly woodblock that you were doing then? Yeah, big Japanese woodblock prints, which are using water. So I was kind of thinking, well, what do I want to make a picture of? And I thought, well, I have to reflect on some of the events that happened during my veterinary training. And this is a, a time when one of our lecturers said that he wanted us to remember how quickly a horse would die if it was shot. And, you know, we stood behind him as he shot this horse. And this is about the time we went to the veterinary pathology lab they slaughter a couple of piglets if they all had flu and they would be sacrifices for their little brothers and sisters and cousins. So I felt, you know, maybe there was time to kind of give a little bit of homage to these um, creatures that had lo lost their lives. And this is a kind of more comical moment when we were practicing our dental skills and they gave us a bag of heads and their heads weren't attached to any bodies. So, you know, it was an interesting time. So I made these prints based on my experiences. But all good things have to come to an end. So I went back to the UK and I didn't have a kind of employable skills as an artist yet. So I um, went back to the vet world and it's full of um, opportunities to be creative and use your hands and um, also full of the usual um, nightmares of bodily fluids and night shifts. And I wanted to show you this email because, you know, this is the type of humor that happens in a, a veterinary practice. The other thing is we have a rabbit in the chiller and there are no notes on the record. Whoever took details of this rabbit or knows anything about it, please let the dead team know. We have not got our crystal ball out today. <laughs> I just really loved it. I thought it was so funny, you know. Of course, you know, we're all alive and we all will die at some point, but there's this kind of like incredible um, camaraderie and humor and tenderness um, and care um, and passion that happens in this field, you know. And was all of that just kind of filtering into your drawing? Because it seems that you're being really prolific with the work you're making at the same time. Yeah, I've always made as a practice outside of my work. So I've always worked, um, I've, I've had a vet job for 20 years as part-time locum. And um, I would spend the majority of my time outside of my work making my um, artwork. So I had this kind of quite rigorous divide. So I'd go from um, vet day to art mode um, in, in the evenings. And a lot of the first work that I made was when I got a residency in um, a place called Print Space, which is near the Tate Modern, it's gone now, um, where we could go in in the evenings. So I went in three evenings a week and made this work. So I made this prints of um, dead kittens um, that looked like they were dancing. And I wanted to pay homage to the fact that there were potential lives that had been cut short 
And I know it sounds very kind of macabre and maybe sad, but at the same time, if we have this um, moment of pause to think about potential, um, they're not forgotten. And um, this also extends to um, babies too. My friend had, uh, she lost a baby in pregnancy. And I thought about, I started to think about souls and where the souls of children go if they don't get the chance to be born. So I made this series of prints called Baby um, using etching techniques, my kind of, you know, still in loving printmaking, but at the same time, use, making imagery that chimed with my everyday experiences. But I think Jake, you really wanted me to talk about how I got to like where I am now. And I realized I like, I've got here through sort of creating my own art degree, which involved lots of different kind of experiences, different residencies. And um, I thought I'd take you through a couple of the residencies. I've been on a few more, but um, here's the Caldera Art Center, the first residency that really made a difference for me. And um, it's in the snow and it's minus 20 degrees and surrounded by forest. And you're about 15 miles from the nearest town. You live in a little cabin surrounded by icicles and there's nobody nearby apart from maybe a couple of other residents. So I've had the first time in my life of just um, playing a lot, like jumping around in the snow, drawing with light, um, dancing, and um, creating narratives in the dusk. So imagining animals um, plotting murder behind the trees and kind of letting my imagination go. And I didn't have to be a printmaker, even though I had trained in technique, I could do anything I wanted. On a really practical note, for anyone that's watching that doesn't know a lot about residencies, I mean, how did you go about finding these and applying for them? There's a really good website called Res Arts, um, I think, or Res Artists, and they have a list of calls. And you have to be incredibly specific about why you want to go somewhere and what you want to do from it. But if you are and you have a compelling conversation about it, then I think there's no reason why you shouldn't be selected. So because I was actually invited to be on the board of select, uh, selection board for the next residency, this one here, Sitka Centre for Arts and Ecology, which um, I said I grew up in a, I've grown up on a main road and I've lived in a city and the wildest bird I see is like a crow. Um, <laughs> please can I go <laughs> and experience elk and you know, wilder animals and the kind of domestic pigeon. And they accepted my um, application. I think if you, if you have this kind of strong narrative, it's very likely that you can do it. Um, residencies are very different depending where you go. So some of them will give you money to go. Others will only pay for your accommodation or your materials, or perhaps you have to fund it yourself. So I was super lucky because most of them would give me free accommodation, place to work and maybe a tiny bit of materials or some kind of support, sometimes food. So it depends where you apply to. But you can imagine like working in a place like this, you really have a chance to reset your kind of routine. So this is Sitka, which is a printmaking studio by the sea in um, Oregon. And there's a beautiful press called the Ray Trails Press and it faces the Sitka spruces. And if you climb the hill, this is what you see is the Salmon River running down to the Pacific Ocean with um, Cascade Head, which is this, you know, temperate rainforest. Uh, so very, very, very wet in the winter months, but beautiful in the summer. And of course you imagine in a place like this, you can have your preconceptions blown away and you can start working in new ways. So, I mean, I was super lucky. I could draw and think and play and I didn't have to necessarily make an output. Mm -hmm. And but, were these solo um, or, or were you with a peer group there? Um, the Sika Center was with two others and Caldera was with three others. 
but they were dancers and um, writers and painters. So it was kind of really interesting. And the, in Sitka, there's a musician. So there's a recorder residency, a clay residency, printmaking and painting. So it's quite interesting and you may not get on or you may get on really well. So, um, but it's wonderful when you make little connections, but the emphasis is not on making connection. The emphasis is on you strengthening what you want to say and what you want to make. So I think that's good. Yeah, but some residencies I make a lot more and I wanted to show you this one, which is uh, another residency in Oregon. It's in the a Native American reservation in the eastern part of Oregon, where it's kind of like a high desert. It's very, very, very hot there in the summer. And it's called Crow Shadow Press with an amazing lithographic studio and a Tamron master printer who was Frank Jansen, this guy here. And then in 2017, Judith Bauman came in, took over, Frank retired. And I went there probably five or six times over a period of 12 years and made things, just thought about things and sometimes made collaborative prints. So I would create a print and they would print it and publish it. But sometimes I just go and think and make things on my own. So I'd make my way there and then stay in the corner and just sort of respond to the landscape and make new ideas. So I'll just show you the very first portfolio I made was this series, which is influenced by the vet um, job. It's about animals and care and how we, how they care for us as well, perhaps. They're kind of these um, strange animal guardians or spirits. And more recently, I made this um, animation, which um, it's called Shadow Boy. I'm just going to show you an excerpt where I jump between frames, but I'm just really happy with it. So another sort of reflection or meditation on uh, us disappearing, but um, a little bit more grounded in the fact that it's um, a culture which is disappearing in the, um, you know, through colonial issues. And I mean, was was that context, like the um, the context of the, the Crow Shadow Studio, sort of something that just fed into the work as well? Or, or was it more explicit? Did you sort of talk to other artists um, around the reservation as well? No, it's, um, it's I, I think the, the kind of benefit of going with a, a really open agenda when you go on a residency is a chance to respond to the landscape and the local history. And when I was there, there was a beading workshop, um, a language workshop and um, very little other kind of other creatives in that area, apart from 
um, the master printers, um, and an archive of really beautiful old photographs which showed me how some Native American dress would be supplanted by Western dress as soon as um, photography had just come in. So there was this idea that there was an aspiration for Western clothing, like an upgrade from your previous humble, you know, or you know, maybe your best clothes didn't look quite as good with an, in the new light. Um, and so I've made a lot of work about how dress and culture has been eroded in this sort of slightly natural, slightly um, pervasive way. Um, and the press is located in an old schoolhouse, which was run by, I think, Catholic um, organization, a church um, with potentially a dark history of maybe not brilliant teaching strategies um, for in regard to teaching language or teaching about culture. So there's a little bit of a dark past and it's hard to not um, notice it when you're there if you if you're on in an intuitive way kind of sensing um, the history about that location. These kind of things are, are, are really obvious to read when you're in that location. So yeah, that's how I respond to things. But I think a lot of people probably do work in that way. And they work mainly with Native American artists who have um, created these incredible, this amazing archive and beautiful works there, which you should definitely look up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I want to talk about how, you know, residencies, residencies aren't so sustainable. Um, you do need a home base. Mm -hmm. So um, home base is East London Printmakers, which was in Hackney in this grotty part of town with a broken bike rack and, um, you know, broken glass and stuff. But a beautiful warehouse studio with grand equipment and very friendly group of people from all over the world and this um, kind of inspiration because we all love print and so we um, would make a box set exchange every year and, and have a show and just kind of swap prints with each other and um, teach together and it's a utopia really in this commercial age to have a group of people that takes um, making an affordable and accessible studio like the main priority and everything else falls away. So I'm really happy to be part of this organization. Do you feel um, like that's being eroded in any way in East London at the moment? No, I think people are like small craft breweries and, um, you know, makers. There's a really strong maker network in East London now, independent people, um, kind of making things which are not available on the high street. Um, there's a very strong um, pottery kind of, I think it's called Turning Earth. So there's a couple of areas where you can go and get pots fired. Um, I think there's a fantastic book center. So I think, you know, for fine art books. So I think we having a mini resurgence because of over capitalism potentially. And we teach each other. So I learned to screen print there. It's my screen prints. I just thought I'd just show you quickly the a series that I made in 2009 about identity. Um, and it's really about how when people see each other's faces, they have no idea about the backstory. So I wanted to make masks that revealed instead of concealed your true narratives or your emotion or your identity. Um, so that's it, nice. Are these about actual people or are they projections or are they you? I think almost everything is me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's loads of backstories. I mean, some of them are more universal. Mm -hmm. So um, for example, Mask Fire has um, the purifying fire, the flames from the head are like the flames that come from the head of the gods that stand on the side of temples in Japan that purify the, uh, the evil and the um, wicked but there's the angel of death swimming down the cheek so this is kind of like symbolism that I've created um, and mask forest I don't know if you can see it but I can't see it on my screen but mask forest is about um, a waiting waiting underneath the trees for somebody to come so I have all these little stories but you don't necessarily need to know them to appreciate them 
or read them. You can read your own stories into them. And yeah. you've engaged with every kind of printmaking. I mean, you know, to say you, you were learning screen printing here, but you've got such an impressive armory of different tools for approaching an idea, an image like this. Uh, well, maybe maybe there was a good um, foundation course going to vet school because it teaches you to be very creative <laughs> with your, <laughs> with your um, equipment. So, yeah, perhaps it was quite good. What drew you to print? Why um, print? I love the multiple. I love the fact you can make a whole load of them and then give them away or sell them at reasonable price. Um, that there's this, I love the language of prints. So I love the line that you make. So in the animation, which you just saw, I made the whole image with one horizontal line and I wanted to see how much you can make with this one line, how expressive it can be, just uh, erasure or removal of something. Um, so I like the language of it, I like the multiplicity of it, I like the democratic social aspect of how, you know, it's um, available to everyone, it's kind of a co community of lovely people who share equipment. So I think, yeah, at heart I'm a printmaker more than any other kind of um, creative practice. Yeah. Right. Let me find this. Oh, yes. I, I did promise to tell you about the Centre for Fine Print Research, which is where I'm working now. It just sounds so fascinating. It sounds mysterious. It is mysterious. It's, um, it's a really kind of hard to define centre because it has old fashioned printmaking technology um, mixed with all these incredible innovations to do with human health, robotics, um, kind of state of the art fabric um, and um, reviving old techniques and seeing if they have modern contemporary um, appeal. So it's super interesting. Uh, I just show you a couple of things. For example, I was playing with this reflective ink. So instead of absorbing light, it bounces it back at you and put it under the microscope. And this is looking at this kind of amazing world of imagery made with reflected light instead of absorbed light. So um, that's one thing. And the other thing is this beautiful project, um, which is called the Robot Calligraphy Project. And um, my colleague Fabio, Fabio Danano is um, programming a robot to draw. And he has made this little program and the robot is dipping a brush in some ink and then it goes over to the sheet of paper and it draws. And even though it's repeated, each time the amount of ink on the brush is different. So there's this real human kind of non, um, non consistent, inconsistent um, effect, which is beautiful. So it's very exciting. Um, but my job is the impact printmaking journal. I'm editing a print journal which is um, taking techniques and ideas and exhibitions and all sorts, and it's a peer reviewed academic journal. So really interesting to hear from all over the world, like lots of people are submitting from various places. Yeah, if you want to know more, we can tell you more. So at the end. Excellent, and maybe I can include some links in the um, recording of the video as well. Yeah. Um, but you're, but... you're really at the cutting edge cutting edge it is cutting edge it's 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 research is interesting because um you don't know where you are until you look back so when you're in it it feels a bit messy <laughs> but i think that's the case for most of life maybe um i'm gonna jump a little bit um onto some of my work and i'm gonna skip past like about 10 years of life um including going to the royal college of art to study a um, master's in printmaking because I didn't make any prints, but I made a film and I made a lot of jewelry. <laughs> and this is my um, final postcard that I, I put out for my end of year show. So I'm gonna jump forward to um, the kind of prints that I've been making over the past four years, if that's okay. That's great. So the muscle man bodybuilder that you saw at the beginning, my dad, he had a really tragic accident in 2014 and he tripped and fell and broke his neck and is still in a care home in a wheelchair, paralyzed from the neck down. 
I used to go and draw him and hang out. He'd tell me stories about his childhood and it felt like um, interesting way of engaging and spending time, but it wasn't really enough. Like I knew when I left, that would be it. So I, at the same time, was given a fellowship at the Royal Academy Schools in London. And I thought, would it be great to give him prints? Like give him a print, he can look at the print and maybe create some kind of visual communication with it. And this isn't the print that I gave him, but it's the first print in the series where I just thought I'm crying my eyes out at this situation. I'm just devastated that he has lost his ability to move when he loved moving so much. I thought, I know, I'm gonna make pictures of the things I see in the, in the schools. And if you haven't heard of the RA schools, it's like the oldest art school in England. It's 250 something years old. And it's got about 40 students. I mean, hardly any over three years and they're all they're fully sponsored and they're wild and creative and like a family there's a really great um, atmosphere in the school so i started off by doing pictures in the life room but after a while i suddenly realized i needed to be in each picture as well otherwise you just see a picture and you think well what's this a picture of so i inserted myself in the corner of every image and um, the rules were that I would make a print every week or two, and there'd be two colors and really quick. And maybe a bit subversive, because at college I was told I was an illustrator. And so I thought, I'm going to be, okay, I'm going to go ahead and be an illustrator and be a bit naughty. This is me sticking my tongue out at the cast corridor lamps. <laughs> and there was a chef at the school called Sefi and her husband John, and they fed us feasts every day and that kind of maybe made the family experience so I had to make prints about that. So to entertain my dad I went down quite a few different themes but there's two themes I'm going to just show you. One of the swimming pools, he loved working out, this is him at age of 75 and um, I was inspired by Dormier who made 4,000 lithographs over his lifetime you know, his kind of satire, and it's this says after water fire. I just kind of love the everyday life observations. And I wanted to put myself in it. So I made pictures of the changing room at the ladies, um, ladies changing room in the pool, and how everybody jumps out of the pool and immediately tries to reconnect with their mobile device um, to see whether anything's happened. And just show you how I draw. I just draw with a brush pen onto my block. And I don't really sketch, I just draw and then I carve it away and it becomes a print. So um, I have very little planning and I usually draw from memory and um, I close my eyes and figure out how it feels to be in that space and then I put it down. And I don't know if that's from practice or from um, being really short-sighted ever since I was a child. So I don't know if I had to always imagine what was going on around me. Um, but this picture is about the mirror in the York Hall swimming pool and how it's very distorted. So when you walk past, you think you've um, transformed into a different kind of person. Um, and very ironically, they made a new mirror, uh, which, this lady would just hang out in front of because it was so clear and crisp. <laughs> so I saw this sign in the Olympic pool in Stratford and I wasn't sure why it was there. It says this hair dries solely to dry your hair. Please do not use to dry your body or any other items. And then about 10 minutes later, I realized that this was the exact <laughs> reason why <laughs> <laughs> why there was a sign up but it must be like a cultural thing because none of the other pools in London have this situation so it did make me laugh and I wanted to make print about how men are happy to show their armpits to the world but women aren't and well I certainly don't normally show my armpits to very many people and um, also how 
before COVID, um, you know, the humour of being in a really big shower area and then the other person who comes in chooses the one right next to you. So that's what this picture's about. Um, or about being in a crowded sauna in the Oasis pool in Soho and how there's a lot of gossip going on. And I'm closing my eyes because really I want to close my ears. Um, but yeah, this kind of humour. And the other thing we had in common was the vet life. So I made a lot of work about that. And it was reflecting about how animals are, especially dogs, are so loyal and caring and compassionate and goofy and really the, the strongest um, bond that some people have within their family. So um, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that in these prints. So, um, they start out with some of the funny things that happen in consultation rooms. And when you were making these, you were still working as a vet, is that right? Oh yeah, I made I made these ones when I was working at the PDSA in Romford, <laughs> <laughs> which is quite funny. Um, but you know, then it's easier to remember what, what the space of somewhere was like. Mm. You can imagine like that lamp, that kind of, you know, those um, white, easy wipe, lamps and the shape of a laptop I kind of remember it so it's easier to depict um, and this guy was easier to depict kind of remembered him but the ladies of fiction is it something you do when you go home to kind of put it all down on straight on the lino block like you no, <laughs> no it's stored in my memory but it's also yeah. stored in the in the sh shape of how things are like um, the PDSA in Romford was training us all to do um, ultrasounds and I graduated exactly the time when it was optional and now it really is mandatory. So um, they trained us and then in came a tiny little um, hamster. And so I thought it would be really good to have a go, you know, and obviously <laughs> the machine's a bit too big for this tiny thing. Um, but I sort of remember how you go into a dark room, you have to have the cord of the ultrasound probe like round your body. And you can remember the twist. You want to look at the screen, but you also want to look at the animal and you're in a very small space. So I kind of drawing what I feel. So I, I, this is the sensation of what it's like to be in this space and time. And the kind of, um, depiction of the hamster and the two people cradling it is also very influenced by like looking at a million pictures from the Renaissance about um, baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph. So it's this kind of, it, I, I do have lots of historical references because um, you know, they, they did the really good depictions of light and darkness and tenderness and, and care. So there is some sort of like knowing construction, but it comes from memory mainly. So this is a hamster. And the same again with the care on the tiny little guinea pig and how we give the same amount of attention to guinea pig as we do to a bigger animal. So, but because it's from memory, look, I've got no feet. I've got no body in this. It just, there's, it's sort of, it's a fake space. Um, this is about uh, the caesareans. Uh, French bulldogs can't really give birth on their own, so they have to have a caesarean. And this is about the day that two caesareans came in at exactly within 10 minutes of each other. So we went, for, we went to do both at the same time. You've got a chain of nurses coming in because you have to take the puppies and make sure they start breathing really quickly. So it's very... And just to remind my dad of all the bad things about, <laughs> about the vet jobs, he doesn't miss it, you know, too much. It's like the fear of having your finger taken off or maybe worse. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to kind of end. I mean, we, I've sort of maybe running late, but um, I want to end with some of the prints that I've made in the past year about the pandemic. 
That, that would be great. And actually, just, just quickly for those that are watching at the moment, if you have any questions, um, do feel free to type them now so that then we can visit them um, straight after this as well, just to keep in time. So by all means, do type a question and I will put it um, to Winjin uh, straight after. So anyway, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so it's been quite a 10 months, hasn't it? It has, hasn't it? So yeah, the idea, I just worried that I was a super spreader and that I couldn't, you know, I would feel completely fine and unwittingly kill various people just by being near them. Um, but I was I'm quite um, happy in my own company before. I used to spend a lot of time on my own. And, um, you know, this is one of those things. It's a um, uh, voluntary self-isolation. So I depicted myself inside a, a thing that looks like a cardboard box from Amazon. Um, having gone in, kept keeping my, um, you know, looking up to the sky for deliverance from this, <laughs> from this terrible situation. And I want to say the positives first. Um, I thought, well, working at home, you can work and you can be in the kitchen next to the laundry, you can eat and drink, um, you can have your <laughs> chrysanthemums nearby. You know, there are a lot of benefits to being at home. Um, but after a while, I really did feel that communicating through the screen is just so demoralizing. Um, this is my fantasy that I would die and no one would know and I'd melt away. <laughs> They'd only kind of break the door down when they smelt something. So my death by email prints. And I don't know how other people are coping, but I've tended to eat a lot. So that's me with my trifle. I've got wine, tea, whiskey, and crisps as well. And I'm hanging out with my orchids. Well, this orchid I managed to kill, so I'm very sad about it. But... And this is the latest print, um, which is called Insulate With Cake. And it's about all the kind of treats and goodies. And in a way, I think metaphorically, we need to make a barrier to protect ourselves against this bad news and you know terrible times. It kind of, it's a, a, a kind of a metaphor, but it is like armor. So I think there is a real strength in this approach. <laughs> so if you're a comfort eater, please join me in your comfort. <laughs> um, yeah, I got to the stage where, because I didn't see people properly, um, I felt like my expression was becoming frozen and I was becoming to a ghost. So this is my paper bag ghost. Oh, I wish I could hug you again. And I just wished not just to touch, but to know that I was touching someone else. So I just wish so much that I could touch my dad and you know, like send my hands over this barrier. They did open up in August and let us visit, but we had to sit three meters away. And I used to wash his face and do his hair. So it just felt awful. And how, how's he doing at the moment in amongst everything? We don't, I'm having a really hard time hanging out and, and catching up with him. I can send him pictures and write to him, but I find it really awful doing a video chat or phoning him. So I'm not really communicating very well that way at all. I'm sending these prints. So they're still trickling through as kind of message from the outside world, but they're not happy ones anymore. There are a lot of sad ones now. <laughs> this is a kind of, you know, the dream that we, we'll be able to have this um, banquet of touch afterwards with anyone we like is like just such a wonderful fantasy. There he is in the stars. But I wanted to end on a positive note. So the comedy has come back. This is the lockdown chop, which is, um, yeah, it's growing out. <laughs> and um, the joy of being in the pool. So I'm really lucky. I, I live near the London Field Lido and it's outdoors, but heated. So we have had months of glorious swimming outdoors that they made possible through COVID secure measures. Um, so I'm lucky that I've had that. And my beautiful orchids, which um, are like 
like my best friends because they hang out with me all the time. And this is a print that I made before all of this happened, but it's called Cassiopeia. And it's just to remind us that the stars are an enduring thing and we should maybe look up in order to look past what's happening at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was just such an incredible journey to take through through years of your life as well. Um, and, and actually, I found your um, your COVID tail prints really cathartic to look at, if that's not an almost sort of selfish thing to say, because I think you've articulated in those images some experiences which we've been sharing so universally. Um, yeah, at first I thought it was just me um, expressing something that I felt on my own and that it was maybe a little selfish, but when I put it on paper, it made me laugh so that it had some kind of therapeutic effect. And then when I sent them to my parents or I shared them on Instagram, then suddenly I got more kind of universal comments that they maybe resonate with other people as well. So. I think your, your vet's dark humor has been quite necessary. <laughs> it is quite, maybe quite good training because I mean, you have to be brave and bold. You have sometimes the most awful tragedies happen, like awful, there's no laughing about it. It's absolutely awful. And then you have to make that go away because you tried and something didn't work and then go in with a puppy and be really, really jolly and bright again. So I think um, because we don't have kind of therapy, we just um, laugh about it or eat a lot of cake. Some good coping mechanisms, I think. Um, <laughs> no, some people have asked some questions. So thank you, everyone, that's put those questions. Um, do feel free to put more as well for anyone that's uh, that's, that's still typing. Um, but I, I did actually have a, a, a couple of questions that I wanted to fire at you, if you don't mind. Um, so I, it's, been, it's been really exciting to kind of see your route um, because it hasn't been conventional and I'm not sure whether anyone really has a conventional route into the arts but I think the notion that one should start with a degree in visual arts and then move to an MA in visual arts and then sort of move into professional practice at those particular stages I think is is, is probably something that needs more widely debunking and it's been great to see your journey as a a vet, but then also through the residencies, sort of in, in different routes. Um, one thing you said earlier was that it, it was commented that you were, were an illustrator. Um, and I know that sometimes that's sort of almost used pejoratively sometimes to, I don't know, to kind of criticize somebody's work. I just wondered if you had any relationship to that idea of being an artist or having an identity as an illustrator or a printmaker, those kind of artist identities how you felt about that? Yeah, that's a good question because um, it is seen of, as less, slightly lesser than fine art. And I went to Royal College when it was in the middle of postmodern gray, photographic, little bit of fluorescent, kind of very, very, very minimal approach. And I, I realized I wasn't cool enough. And I was 20 years too old, you know, like it's just not, it wasn't my cup of tea. So in a way leaving the Royal College made me embrace my folk art roots because I started printmaking, um, making lino cuts on the kitchen table at the age of 12 because I learned how to make a lino cut at school. So, you know, I went back to what I really wanted to do from the bottom of my heart rather than feeling like I had to do something because it was considered more valuable in the fine art world with more, um, yeah, more value, more, more prestige. Um, but I think illustrators, especially the illustrators that I know are amazing. Like my friends, James and Kat in Edinburgh and Ginny and Aberystwyth, and they're just amazing. They just work quickly with amazing visual puns and um, incredible speed and great composition. I mean, these are all things that we should um, cherish, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so I've, uh, just to kind of put a couple of the quick questions that people have asked, um, Sandrine asked when you actually stopped working as a vet, um, but it wasn't that long ago, was it? Uh, I'm still working at a local clinic now and then on Saturdays. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
um, because it's really wonderful to see real people. It's really amazing. And it's, it's, I didn't realize, but I really, really value parts of the job. I find it very stressful and difficult sometimes, um, but I think there are really amazing things about it. The team is so nice and it's lovely to cuddle a puppy now and then. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, that aspect of touch, I think, is something that we've sort of really lost over the, the recent months as well. And that was something we kind of spoke about very briefly the other day, just... Uh, it's something you've explored in your printmaking, isn't it? So uh, ideas of touch or sort of um, touch the notion. It was really interesting what you said about some of your print mate, um, prints uh, capturing the sort of feel of something as well as the look of it. And mm. I mean, over kind of the, the last 10 months, has, has being able to make prints been any kind of surrogate for, for other forms of kind of contact, do you think? Or is it just not, not related? I wonder. I mean, I think a lot of people got into the garden or did, you know, like when um, baking, making sourdough, that sort of desire to move your hands and get them immersed in something that's different from a computer screen. I mean, yeah, perhaps. But I also I, and I guess um, I made with a frenzy because it was like, a, you know, a, an expression. But um I also gained a hundred hours a month from not commuting. So this work has happened, you know, still in the evenings and on the weekends because of just not spending all this time traveling to and fro. <laughs> very good, yeah. Um, I'm glad there have been some benefits to this um, removal of things that we did in the previous world. Um, that involve touch, like having to sit on a tube next to a million other people. I mean, it's really good we don't have to do that anymore. And and at least the shower closeness is going to be reduced as well <laughs> in the near future, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, some people have got some quite specific questions. So Pooja actually asks whether you have a life drawing practice, because I guess at Draw we do a lot of life drawing, but is, is that something you've done much of before? I I've... I love life drawing, but haven't been recently. I would love to join. And especially when you said you have 120 people and you're doing it online, it sounds brilliant. <gasps> so I would love to join you. Lovely, yeah. excellent. I will make sure you can. It's very strange to be present in time with the model. So you know that they're posing on a screen somewhere else, but not present in space. It's a, it's, it's a different experience, but a wonderful one. <laughs> Great. Um, there, there are a lot of messages of thanks and, and enthusiasm, which I will save and pass on to you. So thank you, everyone that's, um, that's added those things in. Some people have asked whether we're recording this talk. We are, and we will make it available to everybody via our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, and there will be the opportunity to go to the Imaginary Pub shortly. So in a few minutes, I'm going to share the link um, and we're going to be going to that Imaginary Pub, which is basically a Zoom meeting in which we can all feel a bit more informal and relaxed at 10 past eight. So I'm going to share that link. Um, shortly. Uh, otherwise, I think we've covered most of the, the questions that people have had. I mean, is there anything, is there anything that you wanted to leave us with as kind of a thought for, because a lot of people that are watching have a personal practice of some kind, drawing their particular printmaking enthusiasts here. Um, you've been really prolific, it seems, over COVID, and I think some people have, some people haven't. Um, have you got any thoughts on on how to engage positively with such a difficult time as we're going through through your artwork? Are there any tips that you could share with anyone of attitude or practice? I think that's really hard because sometimes, you know, you feel clogged down by treacle and it's really hard to make and really hard to think clearly. And I don't think you should feel bad if like, what's happened to your practice has just gone out the window. And it has happened to me in the past. I've had periods of time where I haven't made anything. And uh, when that happened a, long, a while ago, somebody said to me that you should embrace everything you make, even if they're your ugly ones, like your ugly things. Because in a way, like sometimes you stop making because you, 
you feel like something that you make should be better than it is and or that it should maybe it should reflect what we're living in or maybe it should be a true expression of something that you really think and you feel inhibited because your technique isn't the right technique and you know it's really stressful I would say like not to worry about those things I'm just lucky because I was in this cycle of making postcards before this happened so it was portable and easy to do at home but I know a lot of people who make big work are finding it hard to work in their living rooms so yeah let's reach out and um, be more supportive and kind to one another maybe that's what I would say just um, such a wonderful message to to end on um Thank you so much, Winjin, for, for joining us today. It really has, has been a pleasure to talk and to hear about your work and to see such an exciting body of work as well. Thank um, you. So uh, I'm going to draw things to a close there. As my kind of final words, just to everyone that's attended, it's been lovely to have um, such a great turnout. So it's been wonderful to have everybody here. I've posted a link um, to the pub group. I'm just posting a link now to the pub group um, in the chat. So if you did want to join in 10 minutes, it's just going to be a nice chance to talk through um, everything that we've been watching and listening to together. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for coming. Um, recordings of this will be available on our YouTube afterwards. Um, and we hope to see you at least maybe not in real life, um, but at least on a computer screen as little friendly smiling rectangles um, in future weeks and months. Um, so, Winjin, thank you so much. Um, it's thank been you. lovely. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed this talk. It was brought to you by Draw Brighton and is part of an ongoing series of monthly interviews. Hit subscribe to be kept up to date with more. To support what we do and for more information about Draw, take a look at our Patreon via the links in this video.